In this video, we're going to continue our study of vector-valued functions, but we're going to approach it in a slightly different way in terms of the development of our position function. Our motivating example will be projectile motion, which most of you are familiar with through either physics or math classes. And projectile motion simply means the launch of a particle from some location, subject only to gravity, and most of you will have seen that this is a parabola with some nice properties like a vertex, that's the maximum, all those other fun things that come with parabolas. But what we're going to look at is the same shape, but actually deriving why it would be a parabola, and also focusing on the kind of information that would be available if you're doing real projectile motion in practice, which is having a launch height. We're going to start from height zero. Having a launch angle, and having a launch velocity known. And when we frame the question of what happens to the projectile after launch based on those inputs, we can represent it most naturally using vector value notation. And then we're going to see some interesting uh, arrivals of trig functions in this process, which aren't really obvious in the parabolic form. And we'll see how that leads to a discussion of inverse trig functions later on in this unit. All right, let's start off with what we know. We'll make it more concrete by having a variable angle, but we're going to fix the speed, not the velocity. We're going to fix the speed at 60 meters per second for this projectile. And we're going to have the ground level be our launch height. So we're going to have y at time 0 equals 0. And that should be all the information we need. In terms of the physics, the only force that we're going to use is going to be gravity, which produces a downwards acceleration. Now, the beautiful thing about this is if we draw a little free body diagram physics style here, if we have our projectile, then the only force acting is gravity. That's it. FG, that is our free body diagram. Well, that means that whatever's happening here should be quite predictable. What we're going to try to do now is combine our initial information with the one force that's active and see how does that lead us to the whole trajectory, the parabolic arc. We're going to get to that point by trying to find a vector-valued formula for the projectile. Quick side note, for everyone in engineering, you're going to be taking a second-year differential equation class, no matter what discipline you're in. And this idea that we're going to follow through here, where we start with known information like acceleration and try to work our way backwards towards here, the position, this is going to be a theme. You are going to see this over and over again. So treat this as an introduction to that kind of problem area. All right, we want the position. That's great. We don't have the position. What do we have? What we have is acceleration. Recall that if we have our force acting purely downwards, there's zero horizontal acceleration. And we know exactly the acceleration in meters per second squared vertically is 9.8. And we also know that acceleration is related back to position through derivatives. So looking here, if we took a derivative of velocity, we can get our acceleration back. This time, though, we want to go the other direction. And for those who have seen it in their systems, this is going to be integrals. We're going to cover this in much more detail later on. But for an example like this, we can simply use our experience to answer the question, what does our velocity have to be to produce this acceleration vector? Well, what can I differentiate to get zero if time is my variable, well, some constant, let's call it a. a is a constant. And what can I differentiate to get 9.8, minus 9.8? I would have to have a t there. If I differentiate 9.8t, I know I'm going to get minus 9.8, with a slight caveat that I could add another constant to that, and it would still be OK. Well, we're halfway there. We've gone from acceleration to velocities. Oh, except there are some question marks here. We have this A and B that we don't know yet. Well, a theme that you're going to see in future classes as well as now is that we're going to use the initial conditions and here the initial velocity to find A and B. How's that going to work? Well, let's take a look at time zero. We know all the information about the, the launch point and the launch angle and the launch velocity. We know the speed is 60 meters per second and the angle is alpha. 
And what we can do is decompose that structure into a horizontal and a vertical component. So if this is our velocity with a speed of 60, magnitude of the velocity is 60, then this is a simple triangle with alpha here, 60 here. This will be sine alpha times 60. And the adjacent side will be cos alpha times 60. And those represent our x components for the velocity at time 0. And this represents the y component of our velocity at time 0. Well, let's look at our formula for velocity. This formula has to match these values. So if we look at the x component of our velocity at time 0, we're going to get a has to equal 60 cos alpha. Oh, well that's it. We know exactly what our a value is. And wonderfully simple, in a similar fashion, at time 0, the y of our velocity at time 0 only has to be, here's our velocity, minus 9.8t, oh, that's 0, plus b, but our initial velocity in the y direction also has to be 60 sine alpha. And so we know exactly the value of a, the value of b, which means we know our velocity perfectly. So we started with our acceleration, knowing that only gravity is acting. We were able then to work backwards through derivatives to get a formula for the velocity, which is a little general, but then we could inform that choice by knowing about the starting point for the trajectory, particularly the initial velocities here. So let's add these a and b values to our formula on the next page. So here's our velocity again with the two a and b values filled in. This was our a and this was our b value. And what was the question again? Right, we wanted the trajectory, which is the position. Let's call that r of t. We don't know exactly what that r of t is yet, but we certainly know that if we were to take a derivative of it, that's how we would get our velocity. So we're going to apply the same kind of logic. Again, those who have seen integrals, this is great, you can go ahead and do it. Uh, if you haven't, that's totally fine, because you know how to get a derivative of 60 cos alpha, remembering that this is a constant with respect to time. And the answer is, let's move this down so I have enough room for later. Just a little bit down here. The answer is 60 cos alpha, that number, whatever it is, times t. If we differentiate that with respect to time, we are just going to get 60 cos alpha. Of course, there is a bit of flexibility in there, so let's add another constant that we could include if we needed to, and then continue on. The y value is a little more complicated, simply because of this t already in there. And if you think about the ways we would get minus 9.8t, it will be something like minus 9.8t squared. If we differentiate that, we would get, oh, we won't get 9.8t, we'll get 2 times 9.8t. So if we just do a little fudging factor here. If we differentiate this now, the 2 will come down and cancel, and we would be left with minus 9.8t. Perfect. And because derivatives work term by term separately, we can use exactly the same logic for the second term. It'll be 60 sine alpha, which is a constant, times time. And just so we don't neglect our possibilities for constants at the end here, we also have the potential of a plus d at the end. And we can check when we differentiate this with respect to time, we would indeed get these factors here. Well, now we're in the same situation we had with the velocities. We have a general formula, but we have two mystery values that we need to figure out, but we can determine those by the initial conditions. And our initial condition is that at time zero, we start at the origin. This would be a moment if we wanted to, where we could move our initial height up, move to a different initial x, whatever, but we're gonna start easy for now. We're gonna start our trajectory at zero, zero. Then if we take advantage of that fact, x at time zero, we would have 60 cos alpha, but times t. Well, t is zero. We'd have c equals our x-coordinate times zero, which is just zero. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> How about y? 
at time zero. Well, it's going to be this term here, but that's t squared is zero, t here is zero times that. That's just d. The d has to equal our initial position in the y direction, but that's a zero, two. Ah, fantastic. So our position function for the trajectory of a launched particle with 60 meters per second and launch angle alpha is 60 cos alpha times t comma 9.8 t squared over 2 plus 60 sine alpha times t and that's it. This is our perfectly filled out vector valued function for the trajectory. And I hope you can see here